This is a neurosurgical disorder with the highest recorded prevalence in Japan, nearly 10 times what we see in the United States. And once you see the angiogram, the signature is unmistakable. Yesterday, I presented the case of a young patient with brief episodes of weakness and speech difficulty. And today, we're gonna to talk about the condition behind it. Our patient was having short episodes where her arm would go weak, her words would slur, and then everything would return to normal minutes later. She would go to the ER and was told a few times that it was just anxiety or panic disorder. She had no history of infection or trauma, just these quiet little neurological problems. And the MRI was finally done and raised a red flag that prompted a cerebral angiogram. And that showed a pattern that tied everything together. Moya Moya disease is a chronic progressive narrowing of blood vessels that supply the brain. And we're talking about the terminal internal carotid arteries and the first segments of the middle and anterior cerebral arteries. As these vessels narrow, the blood flow to the brain drops. But the brain, being the ultimate survivor that it is, it tries to save itself by building these tiny, fragile little collateral vessels to maintain its blood supply. And on angiography, these little vessels look like hazy and smoky, almost like a puff of smoke drifting up. And that image is so specific when Japanese neurosurgeons first described it, they named the disease after its exact appearance. Moya moya means a puff of smoke or hazy in Japanese. These collaterals are beautiful on imaging, but incredibly weak. They can't carry normal blood flow and they're prone to ischemic strokes and hemorrhages. This disease has one of the most distinct epidemiologic patterns in neurosurgery. It's far more common in East Asia, especially in Japan, where it has the highest prevalence in the entire world. Women are affected about twice as often as men, and it follows a bimodal age distribution, most commonly in children ages five to 10, and again in adults in their 30s and 40s. Genetically, it's strongly linked to the RNF213 variant, specifically P.R4810K, which appears in one in about 70 healthy Japanese individuals. That genetic pattern alone explains a huge part of why this disease is so common there. We separate the condition into Moya Moya disease and Moya Moya syndrome, with the disease being idiopathic and typically bilateral, and the syndrome caused by other disorders like Down syndrome, sickle cell, neurofibromatosis type one, thyroid disease, and other prior cranial radiation. The symptoms depend on age, where children often present with transient ischemic attacks or mini strokes, with short episodes of weakness, facial droop, trouble speaking, headaches, or even seizures. And these are often triggered by things like crying, hyperventilating, dehydration, or fever, or anything that changes our CO2 levels and cerebral blood flow. Adults often present with ischemic stroke or intracranial hemorrhage. Adult collaterals tend to be a little bit more brittle, so bleeding is more common. One of the biggest clinical challenges at this is that the symptoms can come and go. Kids can look completely normal by the time they're evaluated, and parents can be dismissed. Patients can be dismissed. People are told it's stress or anxiety. But every single one of these episodes is the brain saying, I'm not getting enough blood flow. So let's move into the workup of this disease. MRI is often the first test that reveals that something is wrong. It can show small cortical and subcortical infarcts or strokes, border zone ischemia, or even hemorrhage in adults. The flare IV sign is that faint hyperintensity along the cortex, which is incredibly characteristic. MRA helps visualize narrowing of the distal internal carotids and the reduced flow in the MCA and ACA. Perfusion imaging often tells us where the flow is delayed and which areas are at risk. Something that becomes crucial when we plan surgery, but the gold standard is digital subtraction and geography. DSA shows the exact pattern of stenosis, the extent of the collateral formation, and it lets us stage the disease using the Suzuki grading system. And if we're making the diagnosis with confidence, we're going to be looking at the digital subtraction and geography. Diagnosis requires progressive stenosis of the terminal ICA, formation of abnormal collateral vessels, and typically bilateral involvement to get classic moya moya and exclusion of secondary causes. Now, unilateral disease or disease on one side of the brain is possible, but it often indicates moya moya syndrome rather than true moya moya. Now, here's the key point. Moya moya is progressive, 
Medical therapy alone does not stop the disease. Supportive care includes aspirin, hydration, avoiding hyperventilation, treating fevers, and stabilizing blood pressure. But none of this will reverse the underlying problem. The definitive treatment is surgical revascularization, and there are two main strategies to do that. One is something called direct bypass. That's where we take one artery and then connect it directly to an artery in the brain. It's called an STA to MCA bypass. That's where we take the superficial temporal artery and then connect it directly to the middle cerebral artery in the brain. This provides immediate improvement in blood flow and is often best in adults. Now, indirect bypass like EDAS or EMS relies on placing vascularized tissue on the brain's surface, and that'll stimulate new vessel growth, and children do extremely well with this. An EDAS procedure is a surgery where we take a healthy scalp artery and then gently lay it on the surface of the brain without connecting it directly. And over time, the brain grows new blood vessels from that artery, creating natural detours around the blocked arteries. It's like planting a tiny little blood flow seed on the brain and letting it sprout its own new circulation to prevent strokes. Now, most patients get a tailored combination depending on their age, anatomy, and the perfusion status. And the outcome? With timely surgery, prognosis is excellent. Children especially do incredibly well long-term. Adults who present with hemorrhage have a more guarded outlook, but still benefit significantly from surgery. So what happened to our patient? She underwent revascularization surgery. She recovered beautifully. She regained her strength and has not had another neurological episode since that time. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.